Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's so nice to be together. I don't often come to this room for Sunday school, so it's really an honor to do it. Kyle asked me several times to do it, and Adam at different times, and I've just not been able to with my schedule. So this particular semester is a great time for me to be able to do it. Um, so I th I'm thrilled. And I, I want to put you at ease right away about the nature of what we're doing. What I'm doing is not a seminary course. It is it's the likes of a seminary course that I have used prior to teaching actually at the seminary in churches. I've used this material for, for women's retreats and just church retreats in general. And it's, it's a topic that is transformational. So I just wanted to put you at ease, you know, as we start, because of the way Adam at, you know, announced it as a biblical theology course that I teach at the seminary, uh, which is true, but as I just said. So, um, so anyway, I want us to think about this one word, relationships. It's all about relationships. I mean, think about our society. We, we all really love to talk about relationships, don't we? Go to the, you go to the supermarket, you go to, you see the tabloids that talk about relationships, the movie stars and whatnot. Uh, in, the, in the church, we love to talk about relationships too, don't we? This is just a little introduction to the whole topic. Uh, but we especially, especially love to hear how we came to know the Lord. We often ask each other testimonies, don't we? We say, oh, you know, Dolores, how did you come to first know the Lord? And many of you, not all of you, but many of you, I know your story with the Lord. And so, the, the, so relationships is what it's all about. At the end, that's all we have. You know, and on our dying bed, who, who do we have with us? Hopefully, we have somebody represented, re representing someone dear to us, whether it's a family member or a close friend, because why? It is all about relationships. And in the Bible, though, there is just a little different take on this thing. In the Bible, although, you know, we in society and the church love to talk about our relationship to the Lord, in the Bible, the Lord is talking to us, as it were, about his relationship with humankind. And it shows us over and over and over and over again how he seeks after relationship with us. And he doesn't just tell us this once, but over and over again. Literally, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the reader hears. So if you read the scriptures like Kyle was preaching this morning, that message is a resounding message that God is relentlessly pursuing Paul Church for relationship. <laughs> God is relentlessly pursuing people for relationship. And so I want us to think about the lens of relationship. And that is the, the, the theme that unites literally Genesis through Revelation. So the relentless pursuit of God is all about relationship. Now this kind of stuff is very easy to talk to your neighbor about, isn't it? We're talking about witnessing to people. Well, you know, we can think, oh, I don't know all the terms. I don't know the right verbiage. I feel uncomfortable. But how many of us feel comfortable about talking about relationships? Way more of us feel comfortable talking about relationships. And so this is the topic for discussion. And so in order for us to understand this, what I want us to highlight is that he, God, repeatedly comes in visible form, and he comes from Genesis. He comes, it starts in Genesis and ends in Revelation, but he comes from heaven to earth to tell us this fact, that he is desiring to be in relationship with humankind. And he comes in visible form from heaven to earth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to see these crescendos from Genesis to Revelation where he comes from heaven to earth and he makes himself known in very visible ways. And so if we were to sum it all up, and I will in a few words, is what is the relentless pursuit of God about is all about relationship. But I'm gonna even I'm gonna summarize it for us even more. Because from Genesis to Revelation, God is pursuing three things that can be summarized like this: a people, a place, and a presence. If you remember nothing else from these three weeks. I want us to think about this. What is God relentlessly pursuing? Well, he's pursuing relationship, but this is how it unfolds. God is relentlessly pursuing a people with whom to relate from Genesis to Revelation. He needs someone to relate with. 
And then he is relentlessly providing a place for the relationship to unfold. And then at the same time, he is relentlessly manifesting his presence, meaning his character. So think about it. He wants to relate to people. He, he unfolds it in a certain place. And then he reveals his character in so doing. So people, place, and presence. It's an easy thing to remember, isn't it? My last name's Petter. <laughs> Petter and the three Ps or something like that. I don't know. Um, and so he comes from heaven to earth. And the whole of biblical revelation, without, without dumbing it down, can really be summarized as God is relentlessly pursuing a people for relationship, a place for that relationship to unfold, and he is continually revealing his presence. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to think about these great crescendos that I have on this wonderful chart where we see he's coming down, and, and, and I mean this literally, it is a movement from heaven to earth where he comes down and he reveals himself for the purpose of relationship. So today's our big overview, and then in the, next, in the second week and the third week, I'm going to zoom in on one key moment in the Old Testament and then one key moment in the new. But today's just this big picture perspective of how it all, for, all, all comes together. And the word that I want you to remember is not only the word that I want you to remember, not only people, place, and presence, but relentless. The relentless pursuit of God. And this chart is showing the relentless nature of his pursuit for relationships. So let's, let's unpack it and and I can give you a boatload of handouts if you want. Um, but today I just thought, let, let's just enjoy the storyline, the big picture storyline from Genesis to Revelation. And then I could be happy to give you in the weeks ahead a handout or two just to unpack it a little bit more if you like, or just to have some memories, <laughs> some memories of our time together. So it all begins in Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1 and 2, there is a relationship that is assumed it's, of course, with Adam and Eve. They're dwelling with God in the garden. And they have easy access to the divine presence. So let's just, beginning, just begin there because what we have is uh, God created a relationship with creation. We know that with Adam and Eve. And when we think of the garden, we think of, well, a locale that becomes holy because God dwells there. That's the first thing. And so actually, Adam and Eve are dwelling with God in the garden. Somewhere in time and space, God came from heaven to earth, and he decided to dwell with his creation. Like, Genesis doesn't tell us when this all happened. And that's where you have this beautiful picture of the immediacy of Adam and Eve with God in the garden. So think about this for the moment. Who's the centerpiece? Who's the centerpiece of the garden? It's actually God. He is the centerpiece because Adam and Eve are freely engaging him. They're freely walking with him, talking with him. They hear his voice. So the garden is the locale. It's the place for this intimate relationship to unfold. And I like to define it in terms of the relationship as an undefiled, unhindered, unmediated intimate relationship that Adam and Eve have. So in your mind, I, I mean, you know the story of Genesis 1 and 2 and the beautiful interaction that Adam and Eve have with the Lord. It's the picture perfect relationship, isn't it? And a lot of us say, oh, I wish we could go back to the Garden of Eden and all that. Well, yeah, that is the intimacy picture that is there for us. It's a, not only intimacy, but it's an easy intimacy. They're walking and talking freely with one another. And so we have then, in essence, right at the gate, Genesis 1 and 2, we have a people. Who is the people? Adam and Eve. The place for the relationship for Yahweh and the Lord to unfold, that relationship with Adam and Eve is in the garden. And there he is, the centerpiece of the garden. You have that picture in your mind? It's, it's, we're just recalling what we already know. But we have a people, a place, and a presence. And I think this is really important to note because that's what we're going to keep tracing is this people, place, and presence as the thread uh, really throughout the narrative. The idea is to kind of to, to see how from Genesis to Revelation, God is all about pursuing relationship and to kind of demystify the Bible, right? You know, because it does have this beautiful thread that you can see throughout it. And that's my, my hope is that we see the thread um, that is there throughout. So fine, every relationship has its ups and downs, correct? 
So we have this beautiful, unhindered, undefiled, unmediated, intimate relationship where you can see Adam and Eve dwelling with God, but then boom, Genesis 3 happens. Right, Genesis 3. Well, we, we know the events that unfold in the garden, and they are actually tragic as it relates to this people, place, and presence, as it relates to what happens with Adam and Eve. And it affects, of course, all of humanity's relationship thereafter. And so think of this. Think of Genesis 3. That's that dreadful moment of rebellion against God's commands, right? I'm not going to rehash that in too, too many details, but I'm going to rehash the consequences of it. So you, we started out with this beautiful presence and place for Adam and Eve to dwell, but simply because of their rebellion, all of what they had at Eden is lost in one foul swoop. And I want us to think about that. A people, a place, and a presence are lost. Genesis 3, 23 says this, that the Lord God, after this disobedience, he, he kind of kicked them out of the garden of Eden. It actually uses the language, he drove them out. It's the same language that's used when the Canaanites are exiled out of the promised land. And so this strong language that the Lord drove them out uh, implies that they have been then exiled from the very presence of God. They're thrown out of that place where the relationship was unfolding. And they are no longer having that easy intimacy with Yahweh. And therefore, as a result of sin, they are no longer dwelling with God in this immediate presence. And the contrast couldn't be greater from the opening chapters of Genesis. So there is what I'd like to say a loss then of a people, a place, and a presence. Does that make sense? They're kicked out of that garden. And so we have this. Now the question becomes is we have a presence that's lost, a people that are lost, and there is no longer the garden seen for, for this relationship to unfold. Sin, sin, disobedience, marred the people, place, and presence picture. It marred this undefiled, unhindered, unmediated relationship. Because now the relationship is defiled. Now the relationship is hindered. And now what you're going to see through the rest of this chart is the presence has to be mediated because of these new circumstances that Adam and Eve find themselves in as a result of their disobedience. Oh, okay. So we're making our way. Genesis 1, now the, pres so I say the presence is lost. But then we come to another part in this big scheme. We come to Genesis 12 and 15. And I want to unpack this section because this is going to be one of our key texts. Very critical for us as we think about themes and as we think about the theme of the divine presence in the weeks ahead. So we're going to get now in Genesis 12 and 15 a glimmer of hope in of, of, about this loss of a people in a place and presence. Because in Genesis 12, roughly nine chapters after the fall, right, uh, there is this tension in the narrative. Out of nowhere, things are moving really from bad to worse. Before we get to the glimmer of hope, we've got the fall, and then what do we have? We've got the... Cain and Abel scenario. What else do we have? We've got the flood. We've got people trying to seek a name for themselves. So things after the fall are going from bad to worse. And then, so the tension is at a halt, an all-time high. It's not just Adam and Eve, but all these things thereafter, right? And then we come to Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Because God breaks through this mess, if you will. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, is a very familiar text to uh, most of us, but I'm going to read it again. Genesis 12 says this. Again, this is out of nowhere. Things that have gone from bad to worse, and we read this, that the Lord, had, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Familiar, isn't it? We know these verses. You can boil down the summation of those 
promises with three words. He's actually, Abram's being promised a people, a place, and a presence. All of what was lost from the fall, so he's through the, through, your heirs will inherit, well, he's promising a people. You will inherit a land, right? So he's promising a place. And then he says, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. It's not a direct statement. It's not a direct statement of his presence, but it's an indirect statement of his presence because it implies that you hurt me, you hurt my people, I'm going to hurt you, means he's there. He's, he's with them in some, shit, in some shape and fashion, and that will be more defined. And so we read that God, God initiates and breaks into this moment with these promises. Abraham is not, you know, well, the, the narrator doesn't tell us that Abram's like praying for this to happen. We just learn that it does. And so we see that God speaks and appears to Abraham and he promises to Abraham a people and a place and a presence. And he also, this is something else that's really important because we're talking about this theme of relationship. At the same time that he promises these things with his words, Guess what else he does? He shows how true his words are going to be through a very special ritual that takes place in Genesis 15. So let's think about that for a minute. I want us to embrace the fact that he's gonna now temporarily, just gonna be a temporary, I'm just gonna write this here, a temporary, temporary presence. So Genesis 12. We've all heard it numerous times. It's the promises to Abraham. How can they be summarized? People, place, and presence, right? You're gonna just get tired of probably hearing me say that, <laughs> but I'm gonna do it because that's a really good way to hang our hat on the overarching narrative of the story. So he's just with his words then in 12, one through three, promised a people, place, and a presence. But now we read something amazing in Genesis 15. And we will come back to this in more detail uh, in another session. But he appears to him temporarily in the form of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch that's going to kind of ignite, if you will, graciously affect the covenant relationship with Abraham. And that's in Genesis 15. And it's, a, it's you know, a lot has happened between the words that he promises in 12 and then 15, because there's some, you know, Lot separates from him. Uh, there's some rescue, there's some attempt at war, la, la, la. And then we read that God is telling Abraham not to be afraid. And he says, believe in the words that I promised you a couple chapters back. And Abraham's like, okay, well, how can I really believe? Because I don't have an heir. And you're promising a people? It's, it's a contradiction, and I, I, I'm not going to stay long there on this because I want to highlight it next week. But there's a huge contradiction to what God verbally promised him in chapter 12 uh, with his natural set of circumstances. I am childless, he says, so how in the world are you going to give me people and air, right? Come on. I mean, this is, this is humans engaging the promises of God. Okay, so, at this, so it's really legitimate because... Abram really desires to know from God, you know, it, can you really do what you say you promise about people, place, and presence? And so God says, you know what? Absolutely. So he, in his time of questioning, Abram, questioning the Lord, God graciously comes and appears to him. He puts Abraham out, kind of in, I call it a supernatural stupor. Uh, <laughs> there's more on that next week. But... <laughs> And this is what happens. He puts Abraham out in the supernatural stupor, and there's this covenant ritual that takes place whereby Abraham is told this, that he has to, and you can read this in Genesis 15, 17, actually 10 and following, but I don't want to steal our thunder for next week so much, but he asks Abraham to do a ritual that's going to seal the deal about the promises. All right? And... He's going to ask Abram to cut animal pieces from snout to tail and then lay those animal pieces uh, side by side. And then, um, and then something happens to Abram. He goes to sleep. And then what happens is this, is when Abram's in his sleep, 
God comes through this visual aid of a fire and a flaming torch, and he passes through the animal pieces. And through passing through the animal pieces is a statement that he is going to fulfill what he promised. The words that he said in Genesis 12 are going to come to pass because by passing through these cut up, cut up animal pieces, God is saying, let me die like these animal pieces if I don't fulfill what has been promised in this relationship. Oh, so like I said, when we come back next week, I'm going to highlight that a little bit more. And so we read then in 15, 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and he said, your descendants, will, you will have descendants and guess what? They will possess the land. So basically he says, these promises from Genesis 12 by people placed in prison are signed and sealed and they are delivered and they are yours and they are not open to negotiation because of this covenant ritual in Genesis 15. So that's where you get this glimmer of hope. So he comes, um, and I should actually read the passage where it actually talks about the, the presence coming. Um, the sun had yet, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the animal pieces. And anytime you hear fire, usually in the biblical records, but especially the Old Testament, it's representative of the presence of God. So God comes from heaven to earth in this flaming torch, this fire pot, and what is he doing? He is initiating the covenant relationship with Abraham. All his own doing, all his own doing. That is the Lord's undoing, the Lord's doing. And so it's, what we're beginning to see is that what was lost at Eden, God is, what is he doing? He's promising to recover. You see that? By this amazing appearance, this temporary appearance to Abram with a slamming torch. The heart of God is about relationship. And so this is how it gets kicked off. It, 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 it moves forward in the narrative. But then it just keeps getting better and better. We're just getting the gut, we're just getting our, we're just getting warmed up as it were. Because now we come then to so you see the storyline starting to move, get more hopeful. We come to Genesis, Exodus 25. <sighs> Exodus 25, we could stay there forever. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's one of my favorite books to teach. I love Exodus. I actually do teach a course also on Exodus at the seminary. But this is where in Exodus 25, or just in the book of Exodus in general, we see now a relationship is established and it's using Moses. And so we're going to have access to the presence via a tabernacle. And we're going to see this glory cloud. It's called the, the glory cloud in Hebrew is called Kavod Yahweh. The, the glory of the Lord's going to show up in a very tangible way. So now we come to this Exodus story. Again, we're, all we're doing is doing a big picture um, perspective this morning. Several hundred years later, God comes again. He comes from heaven to earth. But this time, he comes in the form of a cloud on top of Mount Sinai. Remember nine, chapter 19. I don't have all the text written on here because I just don't have space. But the first moment after this temporary presence igniting the Abrahamic covenant, we have another relationship that's being ignited through God coming from heaven to earth, chapter 19 of Exodus. Uh, and we read this. You remember the commotion atop Mount Sinai? Do you remember the commotion that's there whenever God is preparing them for the revelation? There's thunder, there's lightning, there's fire. Everybody remember? Well, you may not. Well, let's remember it. <laughs> I was going to say you may not remember it, but let's remember it. Here we are. On the morning of the third day, verse 16, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, right? And that's whenever he tells Moses what he's going to do with them. Um, the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain, and he goes in. So there's this commotion. I can read other verses, but you get the picture? So this is the visual. Now God, now God is going to come, and he has come with his cloud hovering over a mountain. Think of clouds, because he likes clouds. Mm -hmm. That's the way he's disguised. 
uh, in the biblical narrative. And so that's why, that's why we read is that there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain. So picture Mount Sinai if you've ever been there. Mount Sinai and cloud coverage and think of the divine presence. He is showing up, heaven to earth, for what? He's going to ignite now what is called the Mosaic Covenant and the relationship between himself and Israel in the book of Exodus. And so what we have then in Exodus 19 is, remember also these wonderful verses where God says, if you, uh, you've seen what I did and how, what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. The whole point of the rescue mission from Egypt is for relationship. I have rescued you for relationship. So the book of Exodus is all about relationship. What was lost at Eden in relationship we get a glimmer of hope that's promised for Abraham. And then we come to the story in Exodus through the covenant there. I've rescued you for what? For relationship. So that, that relationship is what is driving God's initiative in the narrative. So he elects for, him, so he elects for himself a people, Israel. Okay? Uh, and... And then where is that relationship unfolding? In the wilderness, right? The, the relationship is unfolding right there in the wilderness. The book of Exodus unfolds, well, once they're rescued out of Egypt, chapters 13 and following, they're in the wilderness and they're on their journey in becoming a people of God. They're on their journey relating to this God who just set them free. So you have that picture in your mind. So we've got the people, the place, the relationship is gonna unfold It's the wilderness, but wait a minute, what about the presence? And I left my tabernacle in the car. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, in the garage at home. <laughs> so, so Susan is wonderful. Her, she's fantastic, as we all know, with her artwork. But I have a, well, a desk copy, if you will, a desk size replica of the tabernacle, which I will bring it next week. Uh, because this is the place now <clears throat> where God is going to reveal himself. And that's why 25 is particularly important. Do you remember what he has them do after he's rescued them for relationship? And once they ratify the covenant, once they ratify this relationship, the very next thing he has them do is, well, he commands them to build a sanctuary. Exodus 25, verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I might dwell in their midst. So you hear it. We've got then something remarkable taking place. That's his desire. It's been God's desire from here, but it all got messed up because of humankind's inability. And so now we're, we're hearing very specifically how he wants to make humankind his habitation once again, like it was back in Eden. And so the building of this architectural structure is going to serve that purpose. Let them make me a sanctuary, why? <clears throat> that I might dwell in their midst. So the tabernacle is that portable, remember that? Is that, I could have shown you, but it's very, <laughs> so, so much for being portable. Um, I left it in my garage. Uh, but it's a portable tent shrine that you know the Israelites used throughout their wilderness wanderings. And when that, this is important, but they use, the reason why they use that in their wilderness wanderings is because he dwelled there. And they didn't move on their journey until he moved. Well, how did they know he was moving? Because of chapter 40 in Exodus. It's the crowning moment in the book of Exodus. Because once they build, listen to these verses, they're amazing. Once they build the tabernacle, it's language that is amazing. <clears throat> it says this. When Moses finished the work on the tabernacle, then we read something happened in verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted 
from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they didn't set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all of the Israelites during all their travels. Do you hear the cloud coverage that rolled in again? So you have the cloud temporarily on Mount Sinai, but now you've got the cloud a more, can, can I say more temporary? Is there such a thing as being even more temporary? But it is now moving from the mountain towards another temporary, but a little bit more, you know, it's an architectural structure that they had to set up and, um, gosh, take down every time they moved. But what I want you to hear is what? Filled up this architectural structure, his presence. How did they get guidance? They followed that cloud. And if that cloud moved, they were to move. Numbers tells us that. If that cloud didn't move, they were to just stay in camp. And let me tell you, that is a visual aid what points toward, towards this part of the diagram when we have Acts chapter 2. And the glory cloud comes and fills believers. I'll get there in a few minutes. But it's we're moving. Do you see how the needle is moving? Redemptive history is moving forward. So what do we have now? We have people getting their guidance because his presence is in their midst this, via this cloud. I, the other thing is, I forgot my balloons. I, I, I was sick yesterday. This was the weirdest thing. Um, I was actually in bed all day yesterday, and I thought, Tom's like, Don, are you going to be able to teach? I'm like, you know what? I am going to teach. <laughs> um, I, I, if, I, if I had a fever or something, I would stay in the bed. I promise I wouldn't be here and contaminate anybody, but I just, I don't know what happened. Came, I just was in the bed. Um, and so... I would, my balloons and my little tabernacle, uh, they, they were left behind, <laughs> as it were, because of not having my wherewithal, I guess, as it were. But the, think of a balloon that are, you know, birthday parties, balloons that are blown up, and I, I have white balloons that I love to use. To, to, so the cloud hovering over that architectural shrine, uh, it was a very visible thing. So he came from heaven to earth in the form of a cloud, and he did it in the tabernacle. He did it in the architectural structure of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And what is he doing? He's confirming his relationship with the Israelites. He's got now a people, a place, and a presence that's beginning to be restored. Can you see it? Isn't it beautiful? But oh, it, the story continues. The story continues. We have Israel as his people. The wilderness is for the place for the relationship to unfold, and then he appears, as it were, in the tabernacle, but particularly over the Holy of Holies. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, I wish I would have been an Israelite in those circumstances to have seen that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that have been remarkable to be in the wilderness and to see this cloud coverage? I, I, I have to tell you, I've honestly thought, oh, shoot, I lived in the wrong period of time. I, I wish I would have been an Israelite to see that cloud, you know, just to go. Because when we talk about guidance today, you know, it's, it's guidance for Christians mystifies us. But my vision of guidance comes from Exodus and that glory cloud. And I think it's helpful for us to consider how we get our guidance, too, because that same glory cloud that was out there is in here by virtue of the Holy Spirit living within us. So we'll, I'll come to that in due time. But then we move forward. We move forward because we come to, again, another phase in Israelite history, First, First Kings chapter 8. God is going to come again in the form of a cloud. Are you getting tired of it yet? No, don't. He's going he's gonna re, to renew his relationship with his people, but in a more permanent structure called the temple, in a more permanent location, Jerusalem, uh, and the people are uh, they're, they're largely the same. So people, place, and presence is going to continue to unfold in 1 Kings 8. So he comes from heaven to earth in the form of a cloud yet again um, to situ a situation that's m not as movable but a little bit more permanent. And you know the story of Sam just quickly Samuel and Kings, but... Remember, it was David's desire in 2 Samuel 7 to do what? To build a house for the Lord. Do you remember what was the response of Nathan the prophet is to David who wanted this to happen? No, 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 thank you. Uh, I'm going to build you a house through the Davidic dynasty. No, thank you, David. I'll build you a house. Amazing statement. And so how does he do that? Well, he does it through the Davidic covenant. And so he promises 
David great things in 2 Samuel 7. It's the whole idea he's going to build him a household and uh, the Davidic dynasty is going to be on that throne forever. And it's going to be, guess what kind of a kingdom? Eternal. It's never going to be tampered with, right? So that's just, that's, the second, that's 2 Samuel 7 leading up to this whole point because now what we have is... Um, David didn't get the joy of building the, taber- the temple like he wanted, but who does? Who builds a, te- who builds a temple? Solomon. Good old Solomon. Not good old, but Solomon. <laughs> Solomon builds it. Not so good. Not so good, right? We look at... I got the wrong book. First Samuel 7. First Kings 7, sorry. 751. All right. When Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose before the altar of the Lord, and then he has this incredible priestly prayer, and then he dedicates the temple. And then what do we read? The Ark is in the Covenant, chapter 8, verse 6, and then verses 10b through 11 says this, that, that after the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies, then we read that the priests, they came out from installing it of the Holy of Holies, and then a cloud, verses 10 and 11, filled the house of the Lord so that the priests couldn't minister because of the cloud. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Another filling of another architectural structure. So you got the tabernacle filled, now you've got this temple filled, and what do we have? The people is still Israel. The place for the revelation and the relationship to unfold is more defined as in Jerusalem. And then his presence now is more firmly tied to the temple. And so he's revealing his character. Do you see how it's broadening? The people, with this station, with this presence of the temple, in the land, it's widening the scope of the people and the place and the presence, if you will. Because now all are seeing uh, the relationship that Israel has with their God, and it's, also, it's an invitation for others to enter in as well as they see the sovereignty and the establishment of God uh, in Jerusalem. Well, just so good, right? Just when you think we've got it all, all good, we're, we're done, right? Then we have a huge hiccup, a huge loss. Let me get another color to highlight this loss. Just like the loss in the garden, here, we have another tragic loss. So, just a little bit about the story. Once the temple gets established and the people in the place in Jerusalem, the the people aren't any less undefiled. Their sins continue so much so that it's the prophet Ezekiel who takes us to a temple vision to highlight just how obnoxious their sins were. So Ezekiel chapter 8 through 11, chapters 8 through 11, is a vision of God slowly and reluctantly actually departing now this architectural structure because of all of Israel's sins and defilements. Can I tell you, as we're, as we're thinking of God leaving this architectural structure, it should grip us because think of, think of what it was like down here. What, what was had, what was lost, what was being promised, And now it's starting to unfold with the tabernacle and the glory there and the temple and the glory there. Now we're taken to the heart of the the hub of their harlotries, which is the temple. So chapter 8 through 11, you can read this on your own time. Ezekiel has a, he's, he's a guy, he's been given a guide of the temple. And he sees in four stages all of the defilements of the people. So much so, this is what he says in conclusion uh, to that vision. 
Have you seen this son of man? Is it, is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do these detestable things here in my midst? Must they also fan, fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout at my ears, I will not listen to them. So you, what we see then in chapter 8 of Ezekiel is the sins have gotten to such a place now uh, that he, because of their disobedience, he has he sin, and his people can't dwell together. He has to take measures. And so what happens? They are plucked off the promised land, and the Babylonians are going to come in, and they're going to destroy the temple in 586 B.C. It's a huge loss. And then they're, they're, so you have no temple, which means no presence. You have no place for the relationship to unfold. They're exiled. It's an exile just like the Garden of Eden. They're carried away into exile, and Ezekiel captures the moment so profoundly by showing us, and if you were to you know, have some spare time today, chapter 8, all the harlotries. And the, the, the heart of it is idolatry because they've turned in relationship from Yahweh to something else. He's, he's jealous for the relationship. So he's turning his back on, like, a, like a, a wounded lover, he's turning his back on them because they have defiled this intimate relationship with him. And he will no longer live in the same house. He'll no longer live in the same place. Seriously. It's, 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 it's literally like that. So you have a loss of a people, a place, and a presence. And he says in chapter 8, verse 6, Son of man, do you see these great abominations that the house of Israel is committing to drive me away from my sanctuary? It is, it, it's, it's sad. And so what we have in, in that vision, which I don't have time to highlight right now, is in four movements, the glory cloud that we saw come in Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 8, is now leaving. The glory of the Lord, verse 4 of chapter 10. The glory of the Lord rose from the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. And if I had my little replica here, I could point to it and show you. But he's moved. He's moved out of the Holy of Holies. He comes to the door of the Holy of Holies. He comes to the east gate of the whole structure. And then he finds himself in the mountains east of the city. He has, and, and I think the, the, the prophet shows us in this fourfold stage, it kind of gets to your emotions. It's almost like y'all, he doesn't really want to leave. He, he doesn't really want to leave. And so it's, you know, one step back at a time until finally he's on the Mount of Olives. Um, and, but his presence leaving is now okay for the Babylonians then to come in and deal a death blow to the city and destroy and raise the temple. And that's exactly what they did after he left the building, as it were. And so he slowly, reluctantly leaves. And what do we have? It's a tragic loss. What do we have now about a people, place, and presence? Anything? What's going to happen next? Well, you know the story. They're, God's people are in this situation of loss for about... Well, 70 years. Remember that? Jeremiah says that the time of their exile will be about 70 years. And after that time, he says, I will visit you. I will come and I will visit. Basically, I'm going to come and I'm going to return you to the land. And there's this glimmer of hope. And so there is, moving forward, right after the glory departs, we come to the time of restoration in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Restoration. And there is a temple that is rebuilt. Remember that? There is a, a rebuilt temple in Ezra chapter 6. <clears throat> but there's something remarkable that's missing from the, from the narrator's account of this rebuilt <clears throat> structure. Now, you would think, after what we've seen all along, this, after we saw the glory fill the tabernacle, after we saw the glory fill the temple, after we see the glory depart, now, you would think in Ezra 6 that after the second temple was rebuilt that the narrator is going to tell us that, guess what? The cloud came back again. Yahoo, right? And it's such a letdown because we don't read that that happened. The elders and the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai Zechariah. They finished the temple according to the command of the God of Israel. 
and according to the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. These were all human kings who enabled, of course, the rebuild project. And then what do they do? Just, just so you see, in 16 and following of chapter 6 of Ezra, the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles who had returned to the land, they celebrated, they celebrated the dedication of the house of the Lord with joy. And that's, that, then they celebrated with Passover. There is no mention in Ezra, that's why I have here, no glory. Like, where's the presence? So the people have returned to the land. Not all of them. Not all of them went back. Remember, they went back by virtue of Cyrus's decree. But not everybody went. Some were stirred to go back to the place, but others were not. The people are now mixed. They've been in exile. They've been populated with and had marriages with the peoples of the lands. So when they come back to the land, they're not a purified people at all. And then when they come back, okay, they build the temple. They rebuild the temple. Wonderful. And that's when you think, as the readers of this broad narrative, you think I'm going to see the glory show up. If it happened, and let me tell you, there are scholars that argue that it happened, and I don't know how, <laughs> because, and there's articles that are written on this fact that, oh, the glory of the Lord did come back, but he just didn't tell you about it. And I take great issue with that because of how important the glory of the Lord was for the sovereignty of God and what it meant for his people. So that if that happened at Ezra's rebuilt time, it, when he rebuilt the second temple, I think it would have been said in the narrative. A whole host of other reasons, but what we have then is a modified people place and presence with the restoration phase. It's modified because not everything is as it should be. Think about it. Do we have an undefiled people? No. When Ezra returns, oh my gosh, what are they doing? We don't have time to turn there, but they are... I mean, Ezra pulls out his own hair, and Nehemiah pulls out someone else's hair because... They are mixing themselves, they're mixing, they call it that holy race has been mixed. They're marrying, Israelites are marrying non-Israelites still, even after having experienced exile and sin's consequences, they still are undefiled. Uh, they're still being hindered in their relationship with the Lord. They're enemies in the land. Uh, it's certainly not unmediated because we don't have the visual aid of the, of the glory of the Lord showing up. So things are, okay, positive, but redemptive history is moving forward. Because now we come to John chapter 1, and we come to Matthew 28, because now we have hope for real restoration of a people place in the presence. Hope for real restoration of the relationship. God comes from heaven to earth, and guess how he comes? in the form of a man, John chapter one, verse 14. He comes from heaven to earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I forget that part of my Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. <laughs> John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and did what? It tabernacled in their midst. John is one of the disciples who says this and he says, we, then beheld him, he who was full of grace and truth. So do you see the movement? Incarnation has come from heaven to earth. He dwelt among us. So we've got the presence now in flesh and blood, no longer a cloud. Wow. John and others beheld the glory. So it's the equivalent of the Old Testament glory cloud that they are seeing and touching and hearing. It's a remarkable picture, the very glory of God. And so they saw the divine presence in human form. Of course, the incarnation does what? It affects a new covenant relationship, which means it's no longer just for Adam and Eve, no longer just for the Israelites in the wilderness, no longer for uh, those in Jerusalem, but it's gotten broader now. Jews and Gentiles, the relationship is going to be open for all. So we have a breadth. You see the development of the people, the development of the place. He comes to heaven, he comes from heaven to earth to affect a new kind of relationship. His people are both Jews and Gentiles, and the place for the relationship to unfold is him. He, he says in John chapter 3 that he destroyed this temple 
and in three days, I will rise again. When you come, when, when you come into relationship with him, you're coming into the ultimate of relationship. He comes from heaven to earth to affect this. And that's why he says in the, in the Gospels, follow me. It's all about relationship. Follow me. Wow. And so we learn then that at the end of the Gospels in Matthew, though I will be with you even until the end of the ages. We learn the permanent nature of this presence. And it's ironic because after that he ascends and he leaves. <laughs> like really, how is it going to be permanent? But then the story unfolds. I just want us to think about this before we, highlight, before we move to our closing two points. And that is this, is he comes from heaven to earth in human form. Not in clouds anymore. All can see him. Right? He humbled himself to relate to humankind. And you know what? Communication experts say this, that the most effective communicators relate to their audience. So when God wanted to communicate the most effectively and the most important message of all time, the word became flesh and dwelt in our midst. Talk about that bellowing communication that was given to us in the incarnation. It's profound. And so God's heart is revealed. His ultimate character is revealed. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. So we see in the incarnation uh, unfolding a beautiful reality that God so loved the world that he gave. This shows more than ever his desire for relationship. And then it continues because then we come to Acts chapter 2 and you know how the story goes. We have a relationship that's established with the the aspect of the Holy Spirit now, because now his access is for all believers through the Holy Spirit. What happens, whether you're Pentecostal or Baptist or Presbyterian, Ephesians tells us, right? Ephesians tells us that we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is critical, but I got ahead of myself, but I want to say this. In Acts chapter 2, based on the instructions to stay in Jerusalem until what? Until I leave you a deposit of my presence. That's where we have the disciples. In Acts chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost. They have another appearance of God's presence. Suddenly a sound came from heaven. You know this very familiar language. To earth, from heaven to earth, it says, like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So God comes from heaven to earth and he fills the church corporately and he fills the church individually do you not know that your bodies are what temples Temples of the living god so the church corporate but then individual believers have a deposit of the holy spirit we have a deposit well we have the holy spirit in us but it's god with us so we, we didn't walk with the disciples and Jesus and touch and see him and have those events with him those couple of years that he was on earth. But he deposited in us the Holy Spirit. And the point is this, is no longer will God dwell in houses made with human hands. He's dwelling now in houses that are flesh and blood. And so our bodies become the actual place for the relationship to unfold. Now, I don't know about you, but that is remarkable. Think about the profanity of humanity. Think about the ugly thoughts that you had five minutes ago about this lecture. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> think, about, think about, you know, we, we the, the fact that I stand here and I house God, and you house God, blows my mind especially after thinking of the tabernacle here and the temple there. And now we become that place for the relationship to unfold. We, we, we become, whoever believes then become his people. It's a broad, broad scope, all who believe. So the place for the relationship is not confined any longer to a geographical center. 
The promises go beyond that. The people, place, and presence explodes. There's a population explosion. There is a land inheritance explosion. And his presence now is everywhere via us. We are walking temples. And we are representing God who dwells within us. Otherwise, we are no better than those guys that play soccer on Sunday who have not been regenerated. They're also walking structures, but they're walking dead structures because they're empty. They're empty, abandoned shrines until God comes and fills them with his presence. It's the only difference between us and the soccer players out there. I don't know why I'm picking on them, but I am. (laughs) But we are no longer an abandoned temple worshiping other gods. We are now his. And so the relationship then stretches far beyond Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and literally to the ends of the earth. And so he reveals himself then anywhere through his witness of the Holy Spirit. His presence then is accessible and available to all because humankind becomes his habitation in a much more profound way than Genesis in the garden. This was a great setup. But this is an even better setup. Everybody talks about, oh, we're going to go back to Eden. And I say, no, I don't want to go back to Eden because it was small. The territorial expansion of God hadn't taken place in the garden. It was small. Territorial expansion is when we come now to what we hear, what, what, the rest of the story, actually. What, what the circle is showing us how redemptive history is moving forward and blowing our minds with this reality of a people, place, and presence. It's pretty, it's pretty intense here, but then... We learn the final leg of this is that there is the reality of the relationship for all because all are going to see him, guess where? Coming in the clouds. Oh my goodness. First Thessalonians 4, 16 says this. I'm going to come, God himself will come again uh, from heaven, but this time he himself in the clouds and he's going to descend. There's going to be a loud trumpet and all will see him. Now, I want you to stop and think about that just for a moment. Believer, non-believer alike are going to see the Son of Man, he says, coming in the clouds, and it says, with great power and great glory. So, in other words, those who believe in him are going to see him, and those who didn't believe in him are also going to see him. It's a visual aid that he is coming to do what? Consummate the relationship. I said at the very beginning, it's all about relationship. But the reality of that is there are going to be some that are going to have that long-term relationship with the Lord, and there will be others that won't. He comes to consummate the relationship and his promises to Abraham in a people, place, and presence once and for all. It's an amazing picture that unfolds. And then finally, and finally we come to Revelation 21, because that is where it all collides <coughs> about a people, a place, and a presence. We've come full circle. In, John, in Revelation 21, verse 2, John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and guess where it's coming from? Heaven to earth. It's that movement again from heaven to earth, the eternal habitation of God's people coming down out of heaven from God, and he says it's prepared like a bride who is adorned for her husband. If that isn't the language of ultimate relationship, bride and groom, nothing is a bride adorned for her husband. And then verse three of chapter 21 are crucial verses. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling of God is with men or humankind. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. The dwelling of God is forever with humankind. He will... And humankind shall be his people. So people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that Revelation 7 talks about, they are his. The people has expanded. And then you have the eternal presence of God and the eternal relationship with our creator as it was always intended. And then look at 21, 22 of Revelation. I saw no temple in the city. So we've been talking about structures. We talked about the tabernacle, the temple, us. The temple not made with human hands. And then we come to this moment. I saw no temple in the city. Why? For its temple is the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb. There's no glory cloud coverage needed anymore. He himself is the temple, and his own glory, his own 
brilliance, his own, of who he is, provides light to the city. So all of what was lost at Eden, about a people, a place, and a presence, has now been fulfilled in this moment in Revelation 21 and 22. The people are God's people continually in his presence in a new place, the new heavens and the new earth. And why did this all happen? Well, because, and that's why next week when we come back, we want to look at it further. It all happened because God promised a people, a place, and a presence, something unshakable, something that would never, ever, ever be tampered with. That is why it all happened, because of a God who's gracious and merciful, because of a God who takes initiative. And so what's the point then of this? What's the application of all this as we go home? It's wonderful, isn't it, to see a panoramic view like this. It's wonderful to see, wow, God really is relentless. This is, the circle shows the relentlessness of it, that he really is after relationship. And he's not going to stop until he gets it. Like the Psalm 23 says, surely my goodness and my mercy is going to chase you all the days of your life. This is the chasing of God. The pic- this visual here is, 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 is the chase that God is after us for relationship. And so what does that show us? Well, it shows us so much about his character, which is something I'm going to pick up on in the week two and week three when we discuss this a little bit further. But all of this shows us it's he initiates the relationship. But he initiates the relationship with people who are defiled and who are hindering the relationship with him all of the time. He keeps going after us. He initiates to fix things in a relationship that needs, is desperately in need of reparation. So regardless of humankind's failures along the way, he has a character because of his word and promises to stick with us no matter what. He's gracious and merciful, even though his people turn away from him. He temporarily turns his presence away from us, temporarily, but then he has compassion on us and comes to us again in the incarnation, etc. And so he's relentless for us. He, so this, that should help us, but even if we're wayward, in our waywardness, that he's chasing us even in the waywardness. And how about the neighbors that we know down the street that don't know him? He's chasing them too. This is, evi- this is evidence that he is actually doing that. And he is faithful to do what he says he will do. And that is establish a people, a place, and a presence. And so the beauty then of all of this is that as we look at the scriptures, this, this panoramic perspective, we can see that God is relentlessly pursuing relationship. And the underlying piece for that relentlessness in the relationship is his character. And when, when, we, when we come back for, for next session, that is what I will highlight, is his character that drives him to do this. And so, whether it is in the garden, whether it is in the wilderness, whether it is in Jerusalem, whether it is in flesh and blood, he has come to you and me. And that's a game changer. That's a game changer for right now. So let me just close with this little statement then. The reality of the presence of God in our lives makes a difference. Not just because he saved us and restored us to be in relationship with him. But if you need guidance, anybody need guidance? Anybody just going, God, please show me? Well, the, and you know, sometimes we, we talk to him like he's out there. And I'm not being, I'm not being charismatic here, friends. I'm, I think, I hope I'm being biblical when I say that he's within us. The visual aid of him in the midst of their camp is a visual of what we have with the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And you don't have to speak in tongues to have proof of the indwelling of God's Spirit in us. But the fact is, if you need guidance, he's right there. And so I like to say, and this is, I, I, you know, Marcus and I have done, through, done this chart together. One day he said to me, Mom, will you, will you teach me your chart? We sat down on the iPad and I raced through biblical theology with him. <laughs> uh, maybe in 30 minutes even, I don't know. But, but the comforting thing is the reality of the divine presence. He wants to speak to us. And so the vision I want to have, want to leave us with is those 
balloons that I forgot to bring. Uh, but the glory cloud. They moved when the cloud moved. And that was a place of revelation. That was a place where he would speak to them. So too with us. That cloud is hovering over us. And you know what? People see that cloud. It might not be my balloon that I have to illustrate that right now, but people see God in you, don't they? Something's different about you. And they'll, has, have you ever had anybody say that to you? Huh? Well, what are they seeing? They're seeing the very presence of God in us. And they're seeing the presence of God in our actions, what we say, if we swear, if we, you know, if we drink too much, if we, you know, gam- they, they, see the, they see the contradiction too, right? Which is scary. So they see him in us, they look at us, and they can see that conflict. That's why we have to have godly lives. That's why godly conduct matters because of we're witnessing and testifying to the reality of his presence in our lives. And so, I leave that with you today to contemplate this reality that he has come from heaven to earth to be with you. Not just to save you, but to guide you, to comfort you, and to reveal more of himself to you so that you can become, in a greater measure, more of his son and his daughter. It's a beautiful picture. So that also you can have comfort and not struggle in this journey called life. He is our staying power. His presence is our staying power in this life. So Lord, I thank you for this reality that you have come from heaven to earth, not once, not twice, not even three times, but we see these great crescendos where you keep coming and keep making it clear to us that you desire us for a relationship. And we marvel at that truth. We marvel that that you wanna live in the profanity of humanity, that you want to hang out with us. So I pray that you would help us to live out that reality right today, that we would recognize that you are here within us. You hear our thoughts. You know our thoughts before we move. Uh, But I thank you that we can be secure because of your presence in our lives. So give us a renewed hope in this reality, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, when we come back next week, we'll highlight more one of these elements here, uh, particularly his character, and then we'll go from there. Thank you.